morning. It, uh, I want you to know that we really do know what day it is. Even though if you look at the notes, it may th- you may think that we don't. But it's actually June 4th. Uh, yep, it sure is. And, uh, but I also need to let you know that I am not Casey Robinson. I'm not having an identity crisis. Um, I'm David Beecham, another one of the pastors here at Westside Family Church. Certainly welcome you. Uh, along with others who have uh, done this. And I've been meaning to uh, uh, respond to M- Michelle, who has said, whether it's your first time or hundredth time. And I got to thinking, we haven't even had a hundred times yet here. So uh, perhaps no one's been here a hundred times, but we're getting close. Uh, toward the end of this year, we're, we will have experienced our hundredth Sunday, and that will be a, a means of celebration in and of itself, yes. Um, We've been asking the question, what if the church blessed the neighborhood? And in order, we can reach all the way back into the book of Genesis to kind of get a feel for where we're going from this because God interacted with Abraham in a mighty way. And in his interactions with him, he let him know that, he, hey, you're, you're going to be a blessing to others. In fact, in Genesis 12, I took out a few words to emphasize the blessed part of these verses. But take a look. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Guess what? We can embrace those verses for us as well. I believe that God has blessed us and that we will be a blessing, and that all peoples on earth will be blessed through us. And so, we ask that question. How can we do that? In fact, the series' big idea is this. God has blessed me so I can bless people where I live, work, and play. Now, we we love the word bless, but we've also turned it into an acronym. For anyone that's in the military, that's just what we do. Uh, and, and so BLESS is, uh, also stands for some things. So it's a B-L-E-S-S. The B stands for Begin With Prayer. Two weeks ago, Casey introduced this series to us by talking about beginning with prayer. The teaching big idea was begin, be, uh, being a blessing begins with a prayer to join in the work God's already doing. Now think about it. Is God at work in our world today? Absolutely. Sometimes we, we listen to the current events of the day, like things that happened in London just yesterday, and we say, where are you, God? But I want to assure you, God is alive and well on planet Earth, and He is doing things, and we want to be aligned with His plans and purposes. And we begin doing that by beginning with prayer. In fact, we're encouraging everyone to uh, embrace there's a website called blesseveryhome.com. And I want you, it's there in your bulletin. You can see it and may, maybe you can circle it and say, I want to encourage you to, to go to that website and register and, and, and we want to encourage you to pray for your neighborhood. Now, Casey, two weeks ago, challenged us. He said he's praying for 100 homes in his neighborhood. Whether you do 5 or 10 or 50 or 20 or whatever the number may be, we want to encourage you to pray for the homes in your neighborhood. It begins with prayer. The L stands for listen. Just last week, Casey shared the teaching big idea, listening communicates love and acceptance. And it's not just the listening that says, oh, I kind of hear what you're saying. No, it's the in-tune listening. The listening that if you, you know, if you're glancing at your watch or you have your cell phone out and you're texting while someone's talking to you, that's not the type of listening that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the type of listening where you are just really in tune with the person that you're speaking with and you're listening from. And you're using both ears and your eyes and your body language. Everything's leaning in and saying that type of listening really communicates love and acceptance. In fact, it's, uh, we can bless others best when we listen first and talk less. This week I get to talk about EAT. We'll get to that. I'm really excited about it. The next two weeks we have serve 
and story, and you'll have to come back to hear the rest of the story, so to speak. But this week I get to talk about eating. I have found that eating over almost 60 years of my life is very important to me. In fact, I do it just about every single day. Um, in fact, I've even embraced uh, keeping track of what I eat on the MyFitnessPal app. Does anyone do that? I want to see. Yes, I see those hands. <laughs> I'm not alone. I knew I wasn't. Uh, every single service has had at least one person that has responded and said they're participating in that MyFitnessPal. My brother did it. And so I'm, I'm encouraged because he lost some weight about three years ago. Now I'm his age back then. And uh, so now I'm embracing being able to do the same thing. But that is not what this message is about. It's not about fitness. It's about understanding how God has used eating and drinking over the years of biblical history. And it's something that we need to learn to embrace as well. In fact, if we take a look at the Bible, think about it. What's one of the first things that happened when it came to eating and drinking that really set us up for failure in a sense? Adam and Eve? What did they do? God said, hey, you can eat anything except that. And what did they do? They ate that. And guess what? That set us up for being far from God. Set up all of humanity for being far from God because we learned what it meant and what it is to be disobedient and to be far from God. Interesting thing is that from, from here on out, God seems to be redeeming the eating process. In fact, we, we mentioned it in regards to uh, when we talked about the Lord's Supper, Passover meal, that was a huge deal. And they shared a meal as a nation of Israel and in order to, and some blood was shed of lambs and it was spread out over the doorways and, it, and the death angel passed over and the whole nation of Israel would, would have that meal every single year and remember what happened. It was a huge thing to remember the salvation of the nation of Israel. Well, that foreshadows the blood of the lamb, all of that foreshadows Jesus. And so we fast forward in history to the Last Supper, and it continues on where Jesus is now saying, hey, don't remember that anymore. Remember me. Remember what's happening on the cross where my bo body is broken and my blood is shed. Wow. Eating, drinking, really important stuff. And God has used it to demonstrate his salvation, his grace. One of the neat things that, I don't know if you thought about it much, but how did Jesus demonstrate his resurrection? After he was killed and he resurrected, he, he was seen by his disciples on multiple occasions. One of those times, what did he do? He said, give me something to eat. So he demonstrated the realness of his flesh and the realness of his body by taking food and consuming in the presence of his disciples. Eating is important. In fact, uh, in the, the parable of the prodigal son, uh, sometimes called many other things, but there is a feast. The, the father kills the fatted calf, and it is a, that it represents heaven. That gives me hope, and my thought is that there's going to be food in heaven. No calories, though. And so it's going to be awesome. And so even as we look forward in a hope for glorification, food is involved, eating and drinking. It seems to just be a part of how God has created us. Well, now we need to kind of take a look at New Testament Scripture and see how Jesus approached eating and drinking. First verse I want to bring up is this verse in Matthew 11. And you can read along. It says, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Now if you read the entire verse of Scripture, he, Jesus is responding to critics who were just 
dissing him. In fact, they begin by disrespecting John the Baptist. And they make the comment that John the Baptist didn't come eating or drinking. And yet they called him, you know, said that he had a demon in him. Jesus comes along and does the opposite. He's eating and drinking. And they say, well, he's just a glutton and a drunk. My goodness gracious. And then not only that, they say, hey, he hangs out with tax collectors and sinners. We'll get more into the the whole issue of tax collectors in a moment. But the bottom line is that Jesus upset the culture of the day. Back in February and March here at Westside, we went through a series and the series was one question that changes everything. Is I don't know, I won't put you on the spot. The question was, what is the wise thing to do? Hopefully, you can ask that question every single decision that you make. What is the wise thing to do? Important question. Put it in your mind. Well, the fill in the blank here is that the way Jesus ate and drank was the wise thing to do. So it's important for us to figure out how Jesus ate and drank. And we're going to do that by taking a look at some scripture of some instances where Jesus did actually eat and drink. So let's take a look at the uh, Mark chapter 2 passage. We're going to be looking at Levi here. Now Levi's other name that he's well known by is Matthew. The writer of the gospel of Matthew. He's also called Levi. So in Mark, Mark calls him Levi. So we'll just stick with that name for this story. And Mark chapter 2 picks up with uh, verse 14. And he says, as he walked along, he saw, Jesus saw, Levi's son of Alphaeus sitting at the tax collector's booth. Oh my goodness gracious. Levi was one of those dreaded tax collectors. We'll talk about it in a moment. And Jesus says, follow me. Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the righteous. Not to, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, let's think about who are these tax collectors that Jesus is... The, the Levi was a tax collector. What, what, what does that mean? Well, uh, granted, we may not like tax collectors even now, <laughs> but back then... It, the Jews really disliked the tax collectors because they were fellow Jews who worked for the, the Roman occupiers. They were bad. They were shunned. They were looked down on. They, you, you see, the tax collectors were traitors not only to the nation, but also they were traitors toward God. For they were collaborators with the Gentile occupiers. And they had defiled these occupiers. They shouldn't be there. They had defiled God's holy land. And so, the fill in the blank is Jesus would eat with others who were not like him. Levi wasn't like him at all. Yet Jesus said, follow me. Wow. So the table companions of Jesus led the Pharisees to a fairly logical and reasonable conclusion. That Jesus couldn't be from God. Unless God's grace was just turning the world upside down. So ama- God, a, a grace that's so amazing that it allowed Jesus to eat with his enemies. And so this grace that Jesus was demonstrating was just exploding all of the expectations that, of the culture that Jesus was in. See, meals are a powerful expression of welcome and friendship in every culture. Many of you know that I'm a retired Army chaplain. I spent a few years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and in one of those occasions I got to hang out with an Iraqi translator um, who was 
from Detroit, I think, if I remember correctly. He, he had uh, been born in the northern part of uh, Iraq and then moved to Detroit, and then he was working for the U.S. government. He invited me to his hooch for hot tea and cookies. And it was such a welcoming event. And we would sit down, not, not much space at all, but he, he would have his, he would have it all set up. And he, this stuff that he paid for with his own money. And I felt welcome, welcomed and accepted because he did that for me. This is why Jesus' meals were so significant. You see, the meals were just central to the mission of Jesus. They embodied the grace of God and enacted the mission of Jesus. You see, shared meals are not earned. If you invite someone else over to eat, as they leave, please don't ask them, that'll be $12.50. <laughs> that won't work at all. When you invite someone else over, what you're doing is you're sharing grace with them. And so it's, it's a message that you're portraying to them. And it's a part of, the, part of God's mission at the heart, very heart of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so the fill in the blank is sharing a meal is an act of grace. My wife and I, Deb, my, my wife Debbie and I are, are culture vultures. We watch a lot of movies. I admit it. And the... Um, one of the movies that we watched recently was King, the new King Arthur movie. At the very end of that movie, you know what he's building? A round table. Really cool. Of course, that's part of the myth of King Arthur. King Arthur and the round table. Having that round table communicated acceptance and equality among the knights of the round table. When you invite someone to share a meal at your table, you're communicating acceptance and and importance to that person. It's really pretty amazing how it works. So the fill in the blank is sharing a meal with a person communicates that the person is important. Just that very act. You don't have to say a word. You don't have to say, I think you're important. That's why I invited you over. Don't do that. <laughs> The very act of inviting them over communicates that they are important. Jesus' actions in spending time with sinners therefore transcended the culture. It, you know, and it actually should pretty much define what our Christian culture should be. Sitting at Levi's dinner table, Jesus may have broken some societal taboos. He definitely did. But his presence there also showed that he looked beyond culture and into the hearts of people. The Pharisees who were judging Jesus and everything that he did, they wrote people off simply because of their profession or their past. Whereas Jesus looked past any issues at all and saw their need. There's a lot of needy people in our world today. I have a feeling that some of you may even have some needs. And you're sitting there wondering and saying, wow, I just wish someone would invite me over for a meal. Well, the challenge today will be to look around and it may be for you to do the inviting. Well, let's look at another story. The next story that we're going to look at Jesus is interacting with a Samaritan woman. And many of you may be familiar with this story. It's recorded in John chapter 4. And Jesus is in, and his disciples are traveling from point A to point B. And they didn't have to. In fact, many Jews would go around Samaria. But he chose to go through Samaria. And we pick it up, and Jesus had sent his disciples on into town to get supplies. And so Jesus is at a well. And here's where the story picks up in John chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. 
When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? In order to really understand this story, we need to understand a few things about Samaritans first. The Jews didn't like Samaritans. In fact, the Jews looked upon Samaritans as pretty bad. You don't want to hang out with them. You see, this, this area of north of Judah, where Samaria was, used to be where the ten, tri- ten, ten other tribes of Israel were, and they were exiled several hundred years back. And then, and that was almost all the good people, supposedly, and all the poor trash people were left. And then other people were brought in from other cultures and other religions, and they intermarried, and that's what created the Samaritan people. So the Jews looked upon these people as cultural half-breeds. Was there some racial prejudice? Yeah. And then, what about her being a woman? Jews typically, simply did not talk to women. Just didn't. Was there some gender prejudice back then? Absolutely. And then as a result of the conversation, we find out a little bit more about this woman. And Jesus reveals his knowledge of this woman. And we discover that she's had five husbands. And the man that she's living with right now is not even her husband. She was a sinner. So here's Jesus, in spite of all of these issues that she was a Samaritan, a woman, and a sinner, is interacting with her and and having a glass of water with her. See, Jesus transcended culture here in a huge way. Even his disciples who had been hanging out with him were surprised by this when they returned from town. So the fill in the blank is this. Jesus would drink with others who were not like him. An interesting part of this little story is that when Jesus arrived, he stayed at the well. Why? Because he was tired. It was about noontime. So fill in the blank. He's probably hot and tired. (laughs) He, he, he's spent. And the fill in the blank here is that Jesus engaged others wherever he was and regardless of how he felt. Now, when it comes to you and me, I've got to be honest with you. Sometimes we use excuses for avoiding others. I, I used to do a lot more traveling on airplanes when I was uh, in the army. And sometimes I was just tired and I'd just sit down and close my eyes and say, Lord, It'd be okay if no one talked to me. (laughs) And sure enough, someone would talk to me. And I would need to reach down deep and engage them. Jesus did that. Jesus, in spite of how he felt, did not use the excuse. Jesus doesn't want us to use those excuses either. We need to trust that God will direct us. For Christians, I just, quite honestly, when God does use us, and we see someone as a result of a conversation that we have, seeds being planted and people making even a tiny step forward in following Jesus, there's nothing more invigorating, more empowering, more exciting than seeing that happen. The disciples were amazed that Jesus interacted with this woman, but they were thrilled that as a result of Jesus interacting with this woman, in spite of him being hot and tired, not only she became a follower of Jesus, but the entire town became a follower of Jesus. That's pretty amazing. The teaching big idea, therefore, is this. Eating and drinking with others is a powerful expression of welcome and acceptance. Just that very act communicates 
welcome and acceptance. Okay, we need to have kind of a wrap-up verse, but in order to do the wrap-up verse, I need to set the stage. In order for me to set the stage, I need to sing. Yes, you did hear that correctly. Um, it is a little children's chorus because this, this little passage is from Luke chapter 19, and Jesus is dealing with a, a man named Zacchaeus. So let me set it up for you. If you know this, you feel free to sing it with me. Here I go. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and said, Zacchaeus, you get down, for I'm coming to your house today. For I'm coming to your house today. Okay, how many knew that? Oh, lovely. I see some hands. That's great. Um, obviously, Zacchaeus was a bit vertically challenged, but he was also a tax collector. One of those guys. One of those guys that Jesus was not supposed to interact with. And yet here, Jesus is doing it again. Not only Levi, but he's interacting with Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus sought out Jesus, and Jesus said to him, I must stay in your house today. I'm going to hang out with you, Zacchaeus. I'm going to break bread with you, Zacchaeus. I'm going to eat and drink with you. Wow. He says, in effect, and he says this, salvation has come to this house. The wrap-up verse from this story is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So the fill in the blank is pretty straightforward. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. There's intentionality. This almost reminds us of the Great Commission where Jesus says, go and Tell others, Jesus sought, intentionally looking for. And why? So that people would come to follow him. Jesus ate meals with people. He drank with people. If we routinely share meals and have a passion for Jesus, just as a natural byproduct, we're going to be doing mission for Jesus. Now, Keep in mind, it's not the meals that save people. People are saved through the gospel message through Jesus himself. But meals can create natural opportunities to share the good news of Jesus in a context that just resonates powerfully with what we're saying. One of the great things about mission through meals is that it empowers the people of God. Really, all of us can do this. This. We don't have to understand, oh, I'm going to use a seminary word, missiological jargon. We don't have to understand that, okay? And we don't have to have a grasp of oratory skills. We don't even need to know how to cook. All you have to do is be a people who eat. Is anyone here that doesn't eat at all? Okay, so we all qualify on that respect. We, we're a people who eat. And we are people who love Jesus. That's it. Those two things. And then we can do this. And so, what does eating and drinking with people do? First of all, meals create opportunity to form relationships with others. And second, I will suggest that people observe what is important to you. So you see, these relationships get deepened as a result. And people look at you, just the very act that we, what we've been talking about is that it communicates that people are important. So the very act of doing that is that you are sharing a value that you have. People are important. Second thing is that people observe, observe you. If you pray before a meal, they'll re recognize that Jesus is important to you. I... Part of my Army career is up here at Fort Leavenworth at the Command and General Staff College. And 
I, I was in the old Bell Hall before they raised it to the ground. And they have a ca cafeteria there, and international students who were part of my classes would come to me, and they knew I was a chaplain, they were just surprised that, that what they saw in the cafeteria actually happened. And what they observed was that there were some who prayed before a meal. Muslim students would come to me and say, oh, we thought that there were nothing but pagans here. And so they were pleasantly surprised that there were some Jesus followers as well. It is amazing what actions communicate to others regarding your values. Meals, model, relationships, the gospel, and our mission. Now, I am not suggesting... <laughs> that you do something new to your schedule and add something new. There are already 21, in fact, that's the fill in the blank. I have up to 21 opportunities each and every week to eat and drink where I live, work, and play. They're already there. It's just a matter of thinking through and being intentional and seeking just like Jesus sought out others. Here are some thoughts. You could invite a neighbor over for a meal. Better still, invite a neighbor over for a meal and invite someone that's a, a Jesus follower to come also. That way the neighbor can actually observe your interactions with another Christian. The way, that way you get to do the mission, which is reaching out to people who are far from, from God, and you get to do community, which is reaching out to people who are, already know God. Mission and community are both important when it comes to meals. You can link up with a, another Christian for breakfast on the way to work. You could read the Bible together. You could offer accountability and pray for one another. You could get up, get together with colleagues at work and have, have coffee or have a meal. One of the things I did when I was uh, downrange in particular, does anyone know what the green bean coffee place is downrange? I see at least one hand, yes. I've been there many times. Uh, I just embraced having the green bean coffee ministry of David Beecham when I was downrange. Uh, I would invite not only fellow chaplains, community, but I also invite people who are far from God, mission, and we'd hang out at the green bean on my dime. I only spent money on haircuts and coffee when I was downrange. And so that's just another opportunity. Look for opportunities in your life and see what happens in being able to identify opportunities. What are your hobbies? What are your sports that you enjoy playing and watching? What activities do you do because of your children? Everywhere you go, there's another opportunity for you to engage just like Jesus. You got two blanks in the notes. I challenge you. Put down a name or two. Or maybe you don't even know a name. Maybe you just say, oh, well, there's a neighbor that I don't even know my name. Just God knows the name. You can just put the neighbor I don't know. <laughs> and engage them. Next time you do a barbecue, don't do it in the backyard. Do it in the front yard. <laughs> just share the smell. <laughs> People will come up and say, wow, that smells good. Hey, come on over and have a drumstick. <laughs> you know, just engage people sharing food and drink. Unlike the Pharisees, Jesus didn't require people to change before coming to him. He sought them out. He met them where they were. He extended grace to them in their circumstances. That means that you and I should do the same thing. There's so many people out there that are different from us. There are so many people out there that won't come into this place. But guess what? If you invite them to your place, they'll come. And don't give up on the first time. Sometimes it can take 12 or 13 invitations before they actually come. So don't give up. Be persistent. Jesus knew better than anyone that the kindness of God leads sinners to repentance. So, reason for eating with others? It's really not to have an agenda of saying, I am going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with these people. No. Eating with others is an opportunity to deepen relationships. And so the fill in the blank is eating with others can build and deepen 
a relationship, whether it be for community with those in the body of Jesus or mission for those who are far from God. Both of those are important. And it can lead to emotional and relational intimacy. So the challenge is this. If you're in a blessed group, continue on. If you're not, get together with one or two people. You plus one or two equals a group. And use the talk it over. And you can find that at westsidelevenworth.com. And there are discussion questions. And just get together with one or two other people. And just talk it over. And share a meal. Share a snack. In the next two weeks, we're going to be continuing this process by talking about serving others and then sharing our story with others. Let me finish by sharing a quote from Francis Schaeffer. Here it is. Start personally and start in your home. I dare you. I dare you in the name of Jesus Christ. Begin by opening your home for community. You don't need a big program. All you have to do is open your home and begin. I invite you to join with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, for those of us who are Jesus followers, may we embrace doing what Jesus did, the wise thing, and begin eating and drinking with others to do mission for Jesus and to deepen our community with others. And Lord, for, for all of us, may we be able to see in every time we eat or drink that we can be reminded just as we were reminded in partaking of the Lord's Supper that every single time that we eat or drink, we can be reminded of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. And that through him, we can have new life. Lord, may we embrace the mission and the calling that you have called for each and every single last one of us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, West Side. God bless you. We will have prayer partners up here. Don't leave here without knowing where you are going if you were to die this week. I don't want to sound morbid, but people die. Don't leave here unless you know where you're going after you die. Blessings to you. Bye-bye.